Hi gang, it's Brendan from Spridget Mania. Today we're going to do a video on how to rebuild your front suspension and your front disc brakes on your sprites and midgets. So let's get to it. Okay, this is the existing front suspension and brakes on my 67 Sprite. And you can see we've got uh, the front brakes on Sprites from the introduction of the 1098 engine were disc brakes. That was a pretty sporty option for back in uh, 1964. Um, and the way that the suspension is set up, you can see that it has, there is a large coil spring there, and it's assisted by a lever shock. That's the arm of the lever shock that's coming out. Go into the engine compartment here, you can see the back of the lever shock. And there's the arm, comes down. Um, and the stub axle and the kingpin are right here. This is the steering rack tie rod end right here. Brake disc, hub, and the disc caliper. One of the things you're going to notice right off, you can see, which is pretty common on these old lever shocks, is that this one has completely failed. Um, I have the wheel obviously off of the car and the car is up on jack stands, but you can see that that lever shock is sitting right there on the bump stop, and it's basically, uh, the bump stop is also uh, a bit old and cracked and completely useless, but um, that lever shock actually has to be replaced and rebuilt. Um, I'm assuming that the springs are probably in pretty good condition. They'll probably be reused. Yeah, but we'll need to uh, take everything apart and rebuild everything and get it back together. Um, if you want to see the other side, you can see that this lever shock actually has a little bit of life left in it. It's well off of the bump stop on this side. And this is the left front brake setup. There haven't really been any modifications to this setup. So if this is what you're looking at on yours, then it's pretty much set up as stock. And I'm going to put the camera down now and I'm going to basically tear all of this apart. And uh, once I get to a point where we're going to be rebuilding stuff, um, we'll start uh, filming again from there. I'm going to show you guys something real quick about the disassembly. Um, up to this point, most of the disassembly is pretty straightforward, but there's one thing that I might be able to save you guys a little bit of time and maybe even a little money on, um, on this part of the do-it-yourself. And that is um, basically uh, taking out your uh, coil springs in the front. Uh, don't spend any money on a, on a spring compressor or anything like that. I, mean, I suppose if you already have one, you could try using it, but you don't really have a lot of space um, to actually use a spring compressor uh, on a Sprite or Midget. Um, so I'm going to show you um, a much easier way to take care of it. And um, let me show you how you do that. Basically what you want to do is just take the castellated nut off the top of your kingpin after you've jacked up the front of the car um, underneath the pan and um, compressed the spring a little bit. Once you've done that, um, you're just basically going to want to remove this top castellated nut off of your kingpin. And then after, you also have to make sure that you've um, used a, uh, um, a pickle or some kind of a um, ball joint splitter to um, remove your tie rod end too. And then what I do is I just literally stick it on top like that. And then really all, all you do after that is just very slowly then, I've already removed the spring as you can see, just very slowly lower the jack. And basically what's going to happen is everything will start to unload and slowly and then eventually the kingpin will just slide right out this whole this whole bit will just start to come all the way out I'm just going to speed up the process here a little bit for you and show you what will happen and then it'll separate obviously and then the spring will just be hanging in here and it'll be completely um, decompressed and then just get yourself like a pry bar or something and just get behind it and then just pull your spring right out and it'll come right out. So there's, there's no real reason to, um, 
to get a spring compressor. It, you, you just, there's not really a lot of room in here anyway to, uh, to do that. And by removing just one castellated nut after you've got your tie rod end disconnected from your steering arm, basically the whole thing you know, can just come apart. The only challenge you might have um, is if you uh, don't have the engine in the car, you don't have a lot of weight on the front end. I actually don't have the engine on the front of this car. I just had my daughter actually just sit <laughs> basically um, on the steering rack and give it a little bit of extra weight as it came up. But it, as it turns out, this spring is shot anyway, so it actually didn't have as much tension on it. The other side was a little bit more tricky, but this side actually came out uh, no problem. So that's... Um, that's just one way of uh, maybe saving you guys a little bit of time in disassembly. Okay, here you're looking at the lower wishbones uh, that we took out of my car. And one of the things that um, you're gonna notice is that if you have some, these have been sitting for a long time under the coil spring pressure and you've got bad lever shocks. So if the car has been sitting for, you know, a long time, you're gonna find that you're not gonna be able to remove the fulcrum pin that sits in here that holds the kingpin on there. Uh, the reason is, is, of course, is because there's all, there's all that constant pressure of the spring pressing against this, and eventually it just um, works its way through this metal and it just gets to the point where it gets out of true and so it's impossible to actually extract uh, the pin. You can try cutting it out like we did with this one. I was able to remove the side that actually has the slot for a large screwdriver, but trying to get the other side out because now it's it's almost like a cam lobe. It's sort of off center. This one's just basically impossible to extract. You could probably do it if you get a you know a, a drill press and a, um, a hard enough um, you know carbide drill bit. You could probably drill it out, and you might be able to salvage it. But since you know we have used ones that are good. Um, I'm basically just gonna replace those. Um, if you're gonna replace it with a, with a used one, just make sure uh, that the last uh, fulcrum pin has been extracted cleanly. So you're gonna wanna take the new pin and you know if you're able to thread it like this by hand, um, you know that this, this one is gonna be good. Um, uh, if you have a lot of trouble getting this in there, um, you're going to know that um, it's not true from here to here. So it's probably not one that you're going to want to use as a replacement. So have one of these with you uh, when you go out and check a used pair of these um, and make sure that you can get your fulcrum pin in because um, if you're trying to force it, of course, that's going to mess up your geometry once you get your, once you get your uh, kingpin in there. So... Um, that's, uh, that's something that is very common and so it's also something you might come across and if you do, don't panic. You can still find these available used. Um, you can find them on eBay. You can, you can even buy them brand new. Um, and so instead of spending a lot of time working on my old ones, I'm just going to put these good used ones back on the car and we'll be done with it. Okay. As you can see, we've got our wishbones, our lower pans. They've been redone and we have our kingpins have been installed. Um, a couple things to remember when you're actually working with your kingpins. Make sure to, um, to try to get these as centered as you can when you're putting in the fulcrum pin. You'll notice that um, you can go all the way this way with your fulcrum pin. Sometimes if you do that though, you're leaving your threads on this side exposed. You actually want to get it to where you can kind of get it in the center and you can get your pin through um, to lock it on the flat part of the, uh, of the fulcrum pin. Um, don't forget to put your um, cork washers or whatever kind of washers come with your kingpin kit on either side of that. Um, and then make sure to cap it off um, with the cap that has your zerk fitting. Um, and that's all there is to actually putting the kingpin on. It's not, there's not really much to it. Um, one of the things that I want to show you is um, on the stub axles. Um, we're going to be upgrading um, the front end of my car and what I'm going to be installing are the C-BTA 744 and 745 um, stub axles. And what these are, this is actually 4130 billet steel um, and it's press fit through the original um, uh, iron upright and then it's welded into place. It's much stronger and it'll probably last a lot longer than the you know uh, cast iron type 
um, which are actually prone to breakage. Uh, a lot of race car drivers um, set their cars up with these, um, and uh, I thought it would make a, a good upgrade for, for this car since I plan on driving it. And I'm also going to, when we get to the part with the hubs, I'm going to show you I'm actually going to install the Timken um, style bearings that um, improve better side load than the regular uh, roller bearings that you would, uh, you would put on those. So between the, those axles and the Timken bearings, um, your front end, um, it, it's definitely a huge uh, upgrade on your front end. Um, other than that, though, it's basically, you know, since it's, you know, it's just, it's just a, a, an axle, but it's, of course, in the, uh, the original cast iron part. Um, one of the things that the Kingpin kit that I was using uh, came with is these um, two O-rings. One's got a round profile and one's flat. The round profile should go on the bottom um, where the uh, stub axle actually meets the bottom of the Kingpin here. And then the flat one goes on top of that bush there. And then what you're going to want to do is take your dust tube, they call it a dust tube, which basically is really just there to sort of keep the grease from um, coming out of the, uh, um, coming off of the, um, the kingpin when you have it installed. And you just make sure that you have one that's easily collapsible. You just want to put this over on top of that and squeeze it into place. just like that and that's all set up to go onto your onto your kingpin um, when you buy any of the rebuilt stub axles from us uh, they're going to have the new bushes from your kingpin kit they're already going to be installed and they're also already going to be reamed um, this is the factory 18g uh, 1006a reamer tool um, you may be able to find these occasionally on eBay and other places. Um, uh, you may want to uh, take a look in the UK. Um, occasionally, Sprite and Midget Clubs actually have one of these that they loan out to their members. Um, they are a little bit expensive to buy, and so they, you know, a lot of times the clubs will, you know, take collections and buy one, and then they can use them, and bar, you know, lend them out to their uh, to their members and what have you, um, and. Um, this, of course, um, you can see it's a stepped reamer because, of course, the, the bushes are actually a different size. It's actually larger on the bottom than it is on the top. Um, if you don't have access to one of those, um, I've seen people actually make a reamer tool using an old kingpin. They actually can um, make marks here and here and um, you know, a clever machinist might actually be able to use an old kingpin to ream the new bushes for you. Um, I've seen people do that on the internet. Um, so that's actually another way that you can do it. Uh, but if you do get these axles or, or even the stock ones that we offer, these already do come um, already reamed for you. So they're pretty much plug and play. Um, the only other thing that I did with these stub axles um, is just add the new Zerk fittings um, from the Kingpin kit, which also came with the Kingpin kit. So I've got the new Zerk fittings on it. And as you can see, that's basically ready to go in. Okay, before I show you the video of me installing some of the outer races in the disc brake hubs, uh, for the Timken type bearings, I wanna go over the two different types of bearings that you can use in the front of your sprites and midgets. Um, the first, of course, is gonna be just the standard a factory radial ball bearing, right? That's just the standard bearing. And that's the one that would be the inner one. And then you would have a spacer and then you would put in your smaller outer bearing and it would just stack on there like that, right? Go on there just like that. And then you would put on your washer and your castellated nut. And you'd basically torque it down and you'd be down the road motors and that's all that you'd need to do. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to put on the upgraded uh, bearings, which are a tapered roller type bearing. They're a Timken bearing. And the way that these go on is pretty much the same way, except of course what you'll notice is that the bearings they sort of sit opposed to each other like that. But they do go on the same way, so they will 
basically go on the stub axle and then you'd have your spacer and then you have your outer bearing that would go there and then as you can see that's the way that they go All right see that and then the way that your hub would sit on that um, if you got your hub your hub would go on like that and then you'd have just like that but in order to set these up correctly one of the things that you really should do is you really should shim between the spacer right here using shims and this outer bearing because what you're what you're basically going to be doing with these these types of bearings is you're going to be setting them up effectively the way that the MGBs are set up the MGB always calls for shimming these bearings now the reason for doing that is they want to have a two to four thousandths bit of end float here. It's really just to preserve, preserve the life of these bearings. I know that there are lots of guys that actually don't do that. In fact, there's lots of guys that install these even without the spacer. It's a good idea to use the spacer because then it makes this inner race here, the spacer and the inner race on the bottom, and then the base of the stub axle effectively all one piece, uh, which adds a great lot of strength to it. And then if you shim this outer one to the, fa to the point where with a dial gauge you're getting a little bit of end float, effectively what you're doing is you're reducing the wear and tear and you're extending the life of your roller bearings. So it's not something that I've done before, but that's the way that I'm going to set these up and I'm going to show you guys how to do it using a dial indicator. One thing I want to mention too is that on the bottom of all the bearings there's a little bit of a radius here. Okay. And there's a radius, it's, it's supposed to basically match the radius down here. One of the things you'll notice every once in a while, you'll get, um, you'll get a, a bearing that doesn't quite want to seat all the way down. You'll notice that when I drop this one, you can hear it go clink. You know that that inner, that that inner race is actually making contact with the base of the stub axle itself. That means that when you make contact with the inner race on the bottom, you have the spacer and then you're making contact with the top bearing, this basically all becomes one unit. And so it's all gonna completely and correctly share that torquing load. So that's one of the things that you wanna listen for. You wanna listen for that actual contact. If you can't quite tell um, if something, um, if a bearing is, is seated all the way, um, what you can do, or if, or if, if you notice that, that you definitely have a gap, you wanna take off your bearing and you wanna just basically take some Scotch-Brite and just kind of polish that up um, and do it enough. And what you're going to notice is eventually you'll get it to where your bearing should just be able to slip right on. Um, and then once you have it like that, you know that you've basically bottomed out and that you're good to go. Um, if you have any kind of a big gap there, I wouldn't trust that just putting on um, the castellated nut and then torquing this down is for sure going to make, sh make this bottom uh, bearing race seat. I would take the time ahead of time before you do that and make sure that everything fits like this before you go and torque it. Just makes everything more easy. It also makes sure that your torque setting is going to be correct and that everything's getting set up um, properly. Because what, what might happen is, you know, you could get this to the point where you think that it's right, uh, even though it didn't seat beforehand and you've got it torqued and everything seems to be okay, but then as you're going down the road, it could slip down and then your torque settings are completely off. And then of course, you can totally wear out your bearings and you know, lead to failures and things like that. So it's always a good idea to make sure that this, this bearing is completely seated correctly. And I've seen it both with these billet axles. They can be just a hair out of spec and they just need a tiny little bit of polishing down there at the bottom to get them to do that. Um, if you've got, um, say, a stock axle, you know, something like this, you know, and the same goes for these, you know, you just want to get it to where, you know, that bearing is just going to slide on. Sometimes it needs a little bit of encouragement to kind of go on straight. And sometimes there's just a little tiny part that'll bind up because of maybe a tiny bit of, you know, 
I don't know, pitting or some other sort of a mark that might have happened on it. And if you take the Scotch-Brite, you'll usually notice that you can get it to go slide right on and then you know that you've completely bottomed out that race and so that you won't have any problem uh, down the road. Just like that. Okay, so when you hear that, you know that you're right up against the bottom of it. And, you know, if you, if you have any um, feeler gauges or whatever, you can try to get, you know, a one thousandth in there and I'll bet you that, it, you know, you can't do it. And of course, you want to be putting a little bit of pressure on that. Not a lot, but just enough so that you know that it's seated. And if you can't get that one thousandth in there, you know that you're metal on metal. So that's when, that's the, the correct way to do it. So, um, we're going to use a press. We're going to use this small press that we've got to put these in. Um, honestly, you can just drift these in if you want to. You can just take um, the bearing that's appropriate for the right side. And of course, you're making sure that you're putting it in um, with the, the conical shape going this way. You're certainly not going to close off the race by putting the flat end in. You're going to do it this way. That way the other half of the bearing obviously rides on that part. Now there is a step inside here and when um, you find a socket, I like to use a socket, um, you need to find a socket that's going to fit in that's actually going to go past that lip. So I was trying to fit these earlier and I noticed that this one only goes down to that to that little shelf there, that little lip. It doesn't go all the way, so this is not going to be a socket that you're going to want to use because it won't uh, drift the bearing in um, all the way. You're going to want to find one that will actually go past that right there. That one goes all the way down. So you're going to want to use something that's this size so you can press the bearing race, uh, the cup, all the way in until it goes absolutely flat um, uh, against the stock down in here. The way I'm going to do this is pretty simple. We're just going to set, just going to set that bearing race in there. And like I said, I'm just going to use a socket, one that's small enough. You don't need to use a hydraulic press to press these in. It doesn't really require that much force to sink these bearings into these hubs. Um, the, uh, if you start to encounter any resistance as you're pressing in a bearing, stop. Um, a little resistance is fine, but as it starts to go, it should be pretty smooth. You know that if it's not smooth, then something's going wrong. Either the bearing is going in cockeyed, and you're going to want to either um, drift it until you get it uh, perpendicular with the surface that you're trying to, you know, set it into, um, and then start over, knock it all the way out and start over. If something starts to bind up, you know that the bearing isn't going in the way that it's supposed to, and you need to take a look at it and inspect it. So do it slowly. I think this one just goes in pretty easily, as you can see that. Um, if you don't, have, like I said, if you don't have one of these, you can just drift it in. You can certainly just uh, use a drift and go around and drift it in that way, um, or you can use a socket and uh, tap around it with a hammer. Uh, just be careful and um, slowly as you go. And then, of course, you want to inspect it from the other side. And you want to make sure that you're right up against the lip that's at the bottom of this uh, bore here. And that one looks like it's good, so that one's been pressed in. And we're basically going to do the same thing on the other side, only because I actually have um, the uh, wheel studs here. I'm going to put a little bit of a spacer on this because I don't want to. I don't want to have those studs sitting on the flat surface because I'll have to be pressing against the studs rather than on the center of the bore, and that can just press the studs out. So you don't want to do that. And then I found for the other side, um, I happen to have a, um, a caliper piston 
It's an old caliper piston. It turns out to be just the right size to set against the cup as it goes in the other side. So that works out really well. One of the things you may notice when you put in the cup on on this side is that you may actually want to try to get this started a little bit, maybe with a mallet, um, um, because it has a tendency to kind of want to, to dance around a little bit before you get it in. So you may want to actually do that first. And um, just to get it started, so you can make, make sure Can make sure that you're starting off with the bearing nice and straight. I'll just take this piston here, take a look and see. I can see one side is still a bit high, so I'm just going to I'm just going to straighten that out before I start pressing on it because you want to make sure it's nice and perpendicular, nice and flat. And that looks good. And that looks like we are all the way down. Felt a nice positive stop there. So now that bearing cup is seated all the way. And um, that's really all there is to uh, pressing these in because obviously the other part just sort of floats. One thing that I want to show you guys, if you're going to actually use the competition axles and you're going to use the washer um, the lock tab washer for the outside of this. One thing that you're going to want to do is, if you'll notice, sometimes you're going to throw this on and it may rock back and forth because it's not quite laying flat against the bearing face. If that happens, what you can do is you can just kind of give a little bit of a, take a little grinder to it or a Dremel tool or something and just put a little bit of a ramp um, you know, uh, in the back side of it. Or you can maybe do it with a file. This is pretty hard material. File probably won't work, but you could give it a shot. Flip that over and let that go down. And then it'll sit completely flat against the, uh, the face. And the reason for that is, is basically because this notch here, um, you know, that, where, that accepts the tab on the washer. On the stock axles, um, it can, you can, you'll find that it varies in length. You know, you can find that it can be up to like an inch and in some of them, it's much less than that. And when these stub axles were manufactured, um, they never went down quite as far as they probably should have, so that you usually just need to, you know, slightly change that washer just a slight, slight bit so that it goes down and lays nice and flat against there. Because if you don't, if, it's, if you've got that rocking back and forth, you know, like that, well, that means that when you start to torque the nut eventually, you're actually going to be getting resistance against the washer, trying to flatten out the washer instead of putting it um, on the face of the bearing, which is where the torque needs to be. So just make sure that when this goes on, just like when you're seating that inner bearing against the bottom of the stub axle, that this lays nice and flat and it bottoms out, just like that. Guys, there's something I want to show you real quick. You know, anytime you're working on anything that you're going to have to torque, it's a good idea, especially if you're using original hardware, like I am. I'm using, these are the original castellated nuts. And I'm not gonna replace these, I just bead blasted them and cleaned them up. It's always a good idea to clean up the threads on something like this. So, if you can do it, 
right? Get a tap and die set. It's something that you're going to use over and over again. And, you know, uh, take a tap, run it through, and clean up the threads on the nuts and make sure that it basically will go over whatever it is that you're doing just by hand, nice and smooth. And the reason why you want to do that is anytime you're torquing something, you don't want to fool um, your torque wrench um, into thinking that the resistance uh, from bad threads is, um, is a torque reading, you know? Um, you want this to be as smooth as possible. And so we're also going to, you know, lubricate here when we do that. We're going to lubricate the threads with a little ARP lube, torquing lube. We're also going to put a tiny little bit just on the surface of the washer so that where the nut rides also, this particular part is nice and slippery as well. So that part will be slippery, and then the threads will be slippery, and the only thing that you're actually going to be measuring is the torque. You're not going to be measuring resistance from the threads. And it's something that if you watch Tony, our engine builder, he does this in his sleep. This is something that's really common. And you're always cleaning out the threads of anything that's been painted, especially, or anything that's been bead blasted, or anything that's got gook, you know, and it's got all kinds of old grease and other stuff in it. It's best to always get those things cleared out, especially anything you're going uh, you're gonna to have to torque down to a specific setting. So um, that's just a little tip. So both of these have been cleaned up so that they just go on nice and smooth because that's the way that you want it to be. You don't want to have to be, you know, and doing that. And if you don't have a tap set, you don't have a tap and die set, you know, there is something you can do. You can make sure that this is really nice and clean and then you can, you know, put it on here and you can uh, put a little bit of lubricating oil and then uh, just make it go up and down a number of times and it'll basically cut through the threads um, on its own pretty well. And so that's one of the things that you want to do. So one other thing to note about the spacer, the spacer has to be exactly one and a half inches long. Okay, sometimes these get cut down um, or, you know, over time, if they got compressed or something, they can lose a little bit of, uh, um, a little bit of their length, but uh, usually it's because somebody's cut them down. And so these have to be exactly one and a half inches. And so if you measure yours and you get, you know, right to about one and a half, you should be good, okay? So make sure that this is exactly one and a half inches. If it's not, um, you know, you can make up a, a little bit of it with your, with your shims, but probably not enough. So I would probably just try to get another spacer that's exactly one and a half like these are. Okay, so now that we've got this on here, we we'll take a 15 16 socket and basically we're all we're going to do is we're really only just going to put enough um, uh, resistance on this nut until it just kind of drags. So you can see you just keep spinning it like this and then you're just going to give it a little, you know, tighten it a little bit, tighten it a little bit more, tighten it a little bit more until basically there, you know, so it's, it's just dragging on the bearings. You're not really torquing on it or anything. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this dial gauge, all right, and what we're going to try to do is we're going to set this up so that it's right on the face, perpendicular. And try to load the spring in the dial gauge enough so that you can tell if there's any play or movement. And I'll move the camera and we'll put, put the camera right on that face so you can see what it's doing. So let me continue to zero this out. Jumping around a bit on me. You want to have enough spring pressure on it so that when you make an adjustment, you can actually see it 
Okay, so then when you're lifting up and down on your hub, if there's no movement whatsoever, right, and you're really, you know, you're really lifting on that, you can see that you're basically, you're basically at zero. And this hasn't even really been torqued yet. So, you know that you're going to have to add shims. And so, I had started this process yesterday. And one of the things that I'd noticed was the flatness of the washer wasn't quite there. So, with the 35 that I had yesterday, which seemed right, today I'm going to have to change that up a little bit. So, I'm going to add, I think I'm going to, I'm going to add five thousandths to this, and we're going to see what that does. So for now, I'm just going to remove my gauge. We'll loosen this up and we'll add some shims in there so that we get a little bit more end float and then we'll see where we're at. Okay, let's give this a shot. It looks like we're at about plus or minus one at this point. That means that we're going to need to add about three thousandths more and we should be good. All right, so we are on zero. Now watch. Look, I can put about three thousandths into that. Look at that. So that's where you want to be. Okay, so you guys notice I did this without the brake disc on there. So the only further steps that you have, you're going to Take everything apart. You're going to pack your bearings with grease. I'm going to add the brake disc. Then you're going to put it back together. You're going to torque uh, your castellated nut to about 40 foot pounds. Then you're going to go just to the next hole that you can find forward. And you're going to put in your cotter pin, bend it over, put on your grease cap, and you should be done. Okay, let's see where we ended up. This is where we're at. And as you can see, they are all together. And we've got them basically mounted up to the wishbones. And I'm just gonna go over a couple things real quick. I'll give you the torque settings. So the bolts that hold the hubs to the brake rotors, those are 40 pounds, 40 foot pounds. And if you come around the back, you've got the steering arms and the brake calipers. So uh, the way that the brake calipers are done is you have, first you have sort of the, the bracket that holds the, um, your brake line. And if you're gonna install that, then that actually has to go on first. And then as you can see, you put your lock tab after that, and then you put your bolts through. And these are done to 50 foot pounds. As you can see, you also don't forget to bend over your tabs. Steering arm, these are done at 40 pounds. And again, don't forget to bend over your lock tabs there. Now, another little tip, when you're putting these together, um, the first thing that you're going to want to do um, is you're going to want to slide the... Uh, you're going to want to slide the stub axle down onto the kingpin first before you add your dust shield, because the dust shield will not go on um, after, so, uh, or excuse me, before. So you can't mount your dust shield onto your stub axle before you slide it onto the kingpin. It won't clearance it on the bottom. So you're going to want to put your stub onto the kingpin first, and then the next thing you're going to put on is your dust shield, and then you can start to put everything else um, back on it. Um, so um, as you can see, I've added some aftermarket uh, drilled and slotted rotors. They're made by DBA. Those are available. All the links for all of these products um, are going to be up in the description, so take a look up there. These are stock calipers. Um, these are among the last of the rebuilt calipers that we did here at Spridget Mania. Um, we, we don't do the rebuilt calipers anymore. We only sell them as new because, frankly, it's cheaper actually to sell you a new caliper than it is to do the rebuilt ones anymore. So those are, um, those are available, but, of course, any kit that you buy now or if you get the calipers separately, they're gonna be new calipers. Um, so these have EBC uh, pads in them. Um, and uh, so this is, a, this is a slightly upgraded, well, probably more than a slightly upgraded setup for your Sprite. 
Um, and uh, just um, to go over again, you know, uh, the torque setting for your, for your nut um, inside, again, it's 40 pounds, and then you want to take your castellated nut and then go forward, not backward, but forward then to the next hole. Uh, put your uh, cotter pin through, bend it, and put your grease cap on, and you should be done. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can email me. I'll have my email up in the description as well. You can also give us a call um, if you have any other questions. Uh, if you like the video, give it a like and subscribe. And um, we will try and help you guys out with these videos. And you can add suggestions in the comments and anything else. We'll see you at the next one.